stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. The maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. Father of mercies and God of all consolation, come to the aid of your people turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may attend to your word, confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. O Lord, this is our confession. We are sinful by nature, and we have broken your commandments in our thoughts, in our words, and in our doing. There is no life in us. We are worthy only of death, but we trust in your mercy. You sent your Son, Jesus the Christ, to bear our sin, to take upon himself our death, and to win the victory that grants forgiveness and new life to all who believe. We trust in our Savior and long to hear your words of pardon, hope, and life. The Lord upholds the cause of the oppressed. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien. And sustains the fatherless and the widow. But the, he frustrates the way of the wicked. Therefore, hear this good news. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you. And for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Lord be with you. And, also with you. and let us pray. Almighty and gracious Lord, keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Help us to place our full trust in you. Deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us from all our enemies. And grant to us your saving peace. For you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are our everlasting salvation. To you be glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for the choir anthem, In Christ Alone.
give the choir a hand. That was very nice. <laughs> we appreciate that. The first reading for today is from Isaiah. It comes at a time when Hezekiah is the king of Jerusalem, uh, of Judah, uh, reigning in Jerusalem, and the Assyrians uh, have conquered many of the cities surrounding Jerusalem and are now at the very gates and the walls of Jerusalem. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. The commander stood and called out in Hebrew, hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, he cannot deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given to the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own cistern. Until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. This is the word of our Lord. And now we'll read together parts of Psalm 28. Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. 
My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in song. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them for it. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. And the second reading also from the Old Testament from Jeremiah chapter 17. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. He will be like a bush in the wastelands. He will not see prosperity when it comes. He will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This is the word of our Lord. Then the Holy Gospel from John chapter 7. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked him, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he's deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Has any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him? to find out what he is doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. And now would you please stand for a confession of faith. This is Luther's explanation to the second article of the creed. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. Now please remain standing as we sing a mighty fortress.
you may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we're continuing our series, God's Word for What Ails America. It's a four-part series, as you remember. This is week number three. We'll wrap it up next week. We're talking about some of the things that are significant issues uh, before our country in anticipation of Election Day, which, of course, as you know, is a week from Tuesday. But the issues that we're talking about here in church are not the political issues that are supposedly being discussed during the campaign. We're not talking about health, we're not talking about immigration, we're not talking about taxes. Instead, we're talking about other things that are fundamental, that are, that are just the core of what is significantly wrong and what needs to be strengthened here in our country in order to really take advantage of the incredible blessings that our Lord has poured out upon America. And so for the first week, we talked about this negativity, this meanness that there is in America today, this mean-spiritedness, and God's word, his prescription for that is understand his mercy and live mercifully. Then last week, we talked about paying attention, or more accurately, not paying attention. How many people just kind of let things go, but then complain when they don't see happening what they want to be happening. God tells us we need to be involved. He gave us America, and he made us citizens of this country, and he tells us very specifically that we have a role to play in the public arena. And then today, we're talking about misplaced trust. I'll get to that in just one second. Next week, we'll talk about arrogance. Okay, so those are our two remaining topics. Trust. The topic itself for today was suggested by the psalm that we read at the beginning of the service. In part, it said this. Do not put your trust in princes or rulers, government. Do not put your trust in princes, mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. So it says right there, don't trust in princes. Don't trust in rulers. Don't trust in government. Trust in God. Now, I'll be perfectly fair. When we read this first, When we think about the trust, and I know this is exactly what the psalmist was saying, the kind of trust that he's talking about here is trust for everlasting salvation. It's Reformation Day. And of course, we celebrate, frankly, not just Reformation Day, but every day of our lives, we celebrate that our trust as it is placed in the God who has revealed himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that that trust is not misplaced, but indeed is what is necessary for salvation, right? Reformation. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. That's trust, as revealed in the Holy Scriptures about Christ alone. We rejoice in the fact that as Christians, we can place our complete trust. Jesus, my life is in your hands. And we can know that he takes care of us. He washes away our guilt. He prepares us for that heavenly home that he has has indeed opened up for us. And it's all a free gift that we simply take by trusting. That's how come the psalmist says, don't trust in rulers, in princes, in government. They can't save you. They can't help you. They die, and it's all over. Instead, trust in the Lord, who is very specifically your hope from everlasting to everlasting. He is the one who loves you so much that he is willing to do whatever is necessary to save you and make you the eternal children of God. So when we first hear that word trust, trust in the God of Jacob, Blessed is he whose hope is in the Lord his God. That's the first thing we think about, our salvation by faith through grace. But that's not the only reason to trust God. We don't just trust God for forgiveness and for something that's yet to come in the future, a heavenly home that is still 
ahead. We trust him for that, absolutely, and it's the only way we're ever going to get it. But we also trust God in our daily lives for the things that we need now. Christianity and God are not just for the future, they're for now. So, in the psalm that we read earlier, which said, don't trust in princes, right? Trust only in God. It also said this. The Lord upholds the cause of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. He watches over the alien. He sustains the fatherless and the widow. All those are present day things. It is the present day help as we make our way through this world until that day that the Lord calls us to himself in heaven. But it is God who gives us those things. So it's come. he says, don't trust in princes. Don't trust in, in government. Trust in God. Put your trust there. God provides them. And one of the ways that he provides is through government, is through people who are elected through the political system. It is one of the ways that God fulfills his promises to bless us, fulfills his grace in which we trust so wonderfully. But he says, don't trust in the government. Trust God. Trust him, and then he'll work through the government sometimes, through social agencies sometimes, most specifically through the church in order to care for you and bless you. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this trust in government thing. Okay? We know what the scripture says. Basically it says, don't trust. Now, we're going to understand what that means. It means that we trust in God who will work through his appointed representatives, even the government. But before we go into that, Let me give you some statistics, okay? Did some more research on what do Americans think about their government, okay? What do Americans think about uh, trusting their government? Now, the word trust, as it's used in this, is not about trusting for everlasting salvation. This is about trusting the government to do something right, okay? There's an organization called Pew Research Center, which has been going on, which has been active since the 1950s, And the Pew Research Center tracks trends over the generations. It asks the very same question year after year to see what the trends might be. So beginning in 1958, they asked this question. How much can you trust the government in Washington? So this is not about state or local. How much can you trust the government in Washington to do what is right? Okay, what do you expect that's going to turn out to be? All right. They gave the the choice. All the time, most of the time, some of the time, none of the time. Okay, so your, your choice. The first time they asked that question in 1958, believe it or not, and you'll have a hard time believing this, 75% said that they trust the government all or most of the time. 75%, 75% back in the 1950s. Think about the time. Think about the time. This is right after World War II. Big victory. This is the booming economy of the 1950s. Very specifically, people were buying homes, the soldiers were returning, establishing families. Life was perceived to be pretty good. And 75% trusted the government all or most of the time. Then came the 1960s. <laughs> For those of you that remember the 1960s, that was, that was Vietnam. That wasn't going well. And then that led into the early 1970s with Watergate. And now all of a sudden, trust in government plummeted. I'll give you numbers, just hang on. Plummeted. Okay? In the 1980s, it rebounded 
When the economy rebounded and things were going well, people started to trust the government a little bit more. It dipped a little bit during one of the recessions, then it went back up again in the 1990s when the economy was going well again. And in fact, it even peaked, not anywhere close to where it was back in the 1950s, right after 9-11, right? 9-11, terrorist attack, New York City, Washington. Trust then in the government was over 50%. But it really quickly went down after that. Very, very quickly until we get to today. How many people trust the government all the time? 3%. How many people trust the government most of the time? 15%. Total of 18%. So back in the 1950s, it was 75%. Today, it's 18%. Now, on the one hand, if we look at that theologically, we say, good. We're not supposed to be trusting the government anyway. But that's theological perspective. That's not what people were thinking when they asked that question. They were asked that question wondering, how often does the government do things that are right? 75%, 18%. That's a problem. That's a major problem. A major problem that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when you don't expect the government to do right, guess what the government's going to do? Nothing right. And when you combine that with people who aren't paying attention and combine it with the mean-spiritedness of our country right at the moment, that just sets up a situation where evil can prosper. It does. If people have low expectations, they don't pay attention, and then they get mean about it, how can we expect anything to prosper? How can we expect anything other than what we get? That's how come we go back to the scripture. Okay, so what does God say then? What does God say about us? What's God's word for what ails America? I got some Bible passages. I could go to the ones uh, that I chose for the readings for today. Uh, those are gonna be kind of background. Shorter and quicker with these, because I gotta keep moving here. Oh my, I gotta keep moving. <sighs> You'll take back my gifts otherwise here. <laughs> I'll put them in my pocket before, <laughs> before church is over. <laughs> Romans chapter 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. We need to understand. Oh, we talk about election, you know, and we're talking about a democratic society, but God is the one who's established government. He establishes government for the good of his people. He even says this, they are God's servants. Now, maybe the politicians don't think of themselves as God's servants. They still are. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities. God has established government for our blessing, particularly to keep order in society, to make for a peaceful society in which we can live and go about our activities. That's the purpose. And whether or not you think government is doing that well, it just says that God is the one who has established that, and it is it is the purview of the government to do just that. Now, we can make a point that the government has gone far beyond that, maybe into areas where they don't belong. It doesn't mean that the government's illegitimate. God has established it, and he says that we need to honor it because it is his way of providing a framework which all the blessings that he provides and America can't even begin to list all the blessings that have been given to us. Government provides the framework in which those blessings can be used positively. We destroy government and we complain about it and we mock it and we, we tear it down only at great risk. Only at great risk of making the things that God gives to us 
almost unusable because of the disaster that is around us. It says, that is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay the taxes. If revenue, pay the revenue. If respect, give respect. If you owe honor, give honor. We might disagree with things going on in our government, but it is still the responsibility of all Christians to respect and honor the government as God's gift. And then there's also this. This will be the major point in the last one that I'll make today. Paul writes like this. I urge then, first of all, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority. That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. So here's God's prescription for what ails America regarding this whole trust kind of thing that we're talking about. Pray for your government. Pray for them. Pray for all kinds of things. Pray for wisdom. Pray for a spirit of working together instead of participating in this division and trying to hate and hurt and condemn. Work for a spirit of building together that we are one country that God has blessed us with. Pray that our politicians don't fall into temptation. Temptation, you know that. You know very well how easy it is for you to fall into temptation. Put someone in a position of authority, put someone in a position of power, the temptations increase dramatically. And in Washington, there are temptations that come knocking on the door every single day. Our politicians need the strength of God to be able to resist and to say no and to say I work for the common good not just for the person who puts the most money in my pocket. You see, this is how we as citizens trust God. Not the government. We trust God to work through the government. And we pray to him to do just that. I'm out of time. I'm way out of time already. Um, But do that. It's important to vote. Absolutely. A week from Tuesday, if you haven't already done so, probably many of you have already, uh, but if you haven't already done so, vote. But the prescription that God would also tell you today, pray. Pray. How about doing that? Even when you go and vote, while you're there marking the pages, take 15 seconds. Take 30 seconds. Pray for the people who will be elected. Let's bring his blessing to bear so that we can use all of his blessings to the fullest. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Um, In our prayers today, um, we're also going to pray, of course, for the government. We'll pray for our congregation and our, and our call meeting on Monday. Uh, but then we also heard uh, yesterday about the shooting in that synagogue in Pittsburgh. Um, a man who just hates Jews, apparently, uh, went in and killed 11 people uh, while they had gathered for worship, uh, six injured. Uh, it's a terrible tragedy. Uh, It's unfortunate that this kind of thing happens in our country, but it happens far, far, far too often. So we'll pray about that too. Ethan Meyer, um, son of Leroy Meyer and Jan Jansen, remains hospitalized. Uh, He's got an infection uh, around his heart and around his lungs that the doctors have just not been able to identify. Uh, They're trying to treat him. He seemed to be getting better, and then yesterday things got a little worse again. Uh, So he remains hospitalized. We pray for wisdom uh, for the doctors and for healing. Mary Beth Heeman has been discharged from uh, the rehab unit at St. Mary's, and she's now at a transitional care unit uh, in Lake City.
Uh, she'll be there for a relatively short period of time uh, before she'll be able to go home. Uh, but her home isn't quite ready yet, um, structurally. Th the things they had to do uh, to get it ready for her to be in a wheelchair there at home. But she's uh, doing well, and we th thank God for that. Would you please stand for a prayer? Heavenly Father, we trust in you. Trust completely in you. We give ourselves into your care and keeping. We know that for Jesus' sake, you forgive us and take care of us spiritually and open up heaven for us. But we also trust for your blessings upon our everyday life as well. Everyday life as American citizens living here in this land that you have blessed so wondrously. We thank you for the government that you have given to us. It indeed, uh, in many cases, is the envy of the world. But many times the government messes up, and politicians do bad things, and citizens don't always fulfill their role either. So we pray that you will forgive us, and then that you indeed would bless us through the government, that you give wisdom to all political leaders, give them resistance to all temptations, give them a vision of the common good, and a desire to want to work together to make things better rather than tearing things down and making other people trodden underfoot. <coughs> so bless us, dear God. Help us as we vote to uh, elect the people that will indeed be your wonderful servants. And then help us also to remember to pray, to pray for our government regularly so that this blessing can be achieved. Today we pray also for the people who are affected by the shooting at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. We pray for the families who are mourning deeply of those who, who went to a synagogue and then were shot to death. We pray that you bless them, that you hold them in your arms and comfort them. We also ask for your blessing be upon those who are injured, that you heal them by your grace as well. And again, we commend our country into your care, that this kind of thing can be, unfortunately, common, common. It's not how it should be. We pray, dear God, that you do whatever is necessary to turn this around and help us to live in respect and honor and love of one another. Lord God, we ask your blessing to be with us as a congregation as tomorrow we gather together to decide whether we're going to call an associate pastor and if we call the one whose name is being brought forward. We pray that you give us your Holy Spirit, that we may indeed follow the will of Jesus. He is the head of the church. This is his church. And we pray, therefore, that we will be obedient and faithful in his leading. Continue to bless Ethan Meyer difficult case. We pray specifically that you give wisdom to the medical teams who attend to him, that they can identify what is going on in his body and then provide the right treatment. Still, you are the one who provides healing, and so we pray that you heal him by your grace. Thank you for the progress that Mary Beth Heman is making. Uh, we're grateful that she's now at a transitional care center and one step closer to being able to go home. Uh, we pray that that time comes soon. We pray that you help the family also get prepared uh, so that they indeed can welcome her to her home once again. Continue with Nancy Hankey. We're so grateful she's here today uh, for the good things you continue to provide for her. Be also with Glenn Fine and Mike Fine, Lyndon Luke and Adelia Norgrant and, and everyone else who's, who's got difficult circumstances such as cancer or other diseases. We commend them into your care. Be with Walter Bannon and Gertrude Hoserland and Norm Schultz as they receive hospice care. As they trust in you, may their hope in you be their strength. We pray all this in your most blessed name. Amen. You may be seated. The offering is going to be received. During the offering, if you've not yet signed the friendship registers, please do that. We're celebrating Holy Communion, so check your communion attendance as well. Thank you. Because we are running out of time, we will skip to the prayer for the communicants. Please stand. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. After the dismissal, we will skip the nunc dimittis and go to the colic for the church. Please stand. Now may this body which was given for you and this blood which was shed for you strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. And let us pray. Grant, we implore you, almighty God, to your church, your Holy Spirit, and the wisdom which comes down from a bird, that your word may not be bound, but have free course and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name abide to the end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. Let's go to Bible class in about 15 minutes.